in the first lecture you have uh, like uh, dr akbar took and mashallah he had explained very well to you about the diabetic nephropathy and a few example about the uh, type of glomerular injury and the nephrotic syndrome now we are going to the second part of the kidney as you know the kidney has like glomerulus then you have tubules and interstitium and the blood vessels okay so we are going to know the diseases affecting tubules and interstitium the another name for this is tubulo interstitial diseases of the kidney then a brief about the diseases involving the blood vessels in the kidney then one of the common disease like you can call it is as a like uh, a uh, congenital diseases of the kidney a uh, two common or important congenital diseases of the kidney we are going to discuss then in detail about the obstructive uropathy what do you mean by obstructive uropathy the diseases of the kidney due to the obstruction in the flow of the urine so in these obstruction can lead to a variety of diseases some of the diseases can be a part of tubulo interstitial diseases okay some say like tubulo interstitial disease are nothing but the obstructive uropathy but there is a very fine line of difference between the tubulo interstitial disease and the obstructive uropathy and obviously in we have this case case 8 is related to the prostate so we will discuss about the few a very common problem of the prostate the pathogenesis of those two diseases <clears throat> okay <clears throat> so before starting the lecture proper we'll see what are the symptoms in a patient which will make you think our patient is having involvement of the lower urinary tract system or these are the lutes the lower urinary tract symptom one of the most important symptom is dysuria difficulty in the passing urine or pain during passing the urine then we have the frequency of micturition okay someone can call it as a polyuria but here you have like a small amount of urine passing frequently in the polyuria we have the frequent passing of the urine which is more than 2 1000 ml or more than 2 liters okay here we don't have that criteria of the 2 liter a person might be having the normal urine output but he will go repeatedly or he might have the less urine output but he might go for the micturition frequently then incontinence of the urine where the patient does not have control over the urine he will uh, like the he will have the like dribbling of the urine or he has complain of the passing urine when he were whenever he or she coughs or whenever he she sneezes or whenever there is a increase in abdominal pressure he just lose his urine okay then poor urinary stream a uh, person will know what is there is what is his normal urinary stream and he might complain doctor my stream of the urine has become very weak i don't have a normal stream of the urine then another important complaint of the lower urinary tract symptoms is hematuria and pain pain can be feel while passing the urine or can be feel do in the loin area or can be seen throughout the tract of the ureter start from the kidney and can feel till the tip of the uh, like urethra in cases in the female in the vagina or in male it is tip of the penis okay yes can you share the whole screen not only the powerpoint we are still on the first slide Oh, you are still on the first slide. Yes. Now. Now it's moving, but when you any when you now. Now, now it's not. No, no, it's not. Not moving. You can share. No, you can share the whole screen. Okay. From Teams, then it will. Okay, uh, I'll see. Move. I'll go. I'll go. Better. To the Teams, because you know the Teams is not working, so there is a. problem with my team this always ask for the update okay, share screen okay entire screen
share okay and from there i'll take this and i will show this now it is is it moving yes yes yeah, no, is it moving okay yes it's good okay then i'm sorry for the inconvenience okay so these are all our symptoms and you know the lower urinary tract infection can eventually affect the upper urinary system especially the kidneys and they went might land up into the renal failure sometime acute and most of the time chronic renal failure due to the obstruction of the flow to the urine okay so now we go to the tubulo interstitial disorder or tubulo interstitial diseases of the kidney okay it is mainly due to the inflammation and where is the inflammation inflammation in the tubules and interstitium and from where this inflammation comes most commonly this inflammation comes through infection but sometime it might come through the ischemia chronic ischemia or due to that some toxic toxin or toxin substances or sometime drugs can leading to the direct injury to the tubular epithelium so this is known as the acute tubular necrosis or atn okay so we have inflammatory involvement of the tubules and the interstitium due to infection or ischemia or toxic injuries okay and how does it manifest it manifest in the form of either pyelonephritis which is nothing but the inflammation of the uh, nephrons or the you like what you call it the collecting system of the urines okay and it can be acute or chronic then we can have another form is interstitial nephritis okay it is like what we call it is the morphological appearance of the acute tubular injury and a clinical syndrome of this interstitial nephritis is known as acute kidney injury and what are the causes for this the most common are the drugs sometime non bacterial infections and due to allergic reaction like mismatch blood transfusion or allergies allergic reaction to the drug sometime drugs can cause allergic reaction and sometimes drugs can cause direct toxicity and the allergic reaction to the food or some allergens then we have analgesic nephropathy analgesic nephropathy is also a part of tubulo interstitial disorder and you know the persons who take uh, anti non like non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or analgesic drugs that might lead to development of the special tubulo interstitial disorder and it's known as the analgesic nephropathy and one of the common cause of the renal failure then we have uric acid induced nephropathy and acute tubular necrosis which is a part of interstitial nephritis so these are the spectrum of tubulo interstitial disorders so we'll go to the first and most important part of the tubulo interstitial disease which is pyelonephritis inflammation of the tubules interstitium and renal pelvis it occurs in two form acute and the chronic form acute is caused by the bacterial infection and it is usually associated with the lower urinary tract infection a person has lower urinary tract infection it rapidly progress or ascends to the upper urinary tract infection and if a patient has diabetes or poor immunity it might develop acute pyelonephritis sometime it may be caused by virus and especially the polyoma virus the polyoma virus in a case of the renal transplant patient you need to be very very care careful about it because if you don't detect it earlier it may lead to the transplant rejection so acute pyelonephritis majority of the time caused by bacteria but when you see specifically in the transplant patient you must look for the polyoma virus like chronic pyelonephritis like it is usually for in the previously it usually used for the 10 to 20% of the patients for the renal transplant and the dialysis due to chronic pyelonephritis but now this percentage has been decreased dramatically because we have now know very well 
about the reflux usually we identify the reflux at the earlier stages we treat the patient so that the patient does not go under the chronic pyelonephritis and requiring the dialysis or the transplantation okay so this it is incidents have come so what are the types of pyelonephritis we have two types one is the bacterial infection bacterial infections coming either from the lower urinary tract ascending infection or coming through the blood if suppose someone is having somewhere focus of infections spleen or the lungs or the meninges from there the bacteremia the bacteremia will come to the kidney the blood infected blood comes to the kidney and that can lead to the hematogenous chronic pyelonephritis and another one is like due to obstruction is the obstruction of the flow then can lead to the stasis of the urine in the pelvic lysis system and the chances of increased infection or sometimes by seco ureter reflux this is a congenital anomaly in which what happens there is back flow of the urine from bladder to the ureter okay usually the flow is one direction it comes from ureter to the kidney or uh, sorry ureter to the bladder but in this way psycho ureteral reflex reflux whenever a patient micturate there is you know the micturation reflex very well okay the physiology of the micturation reflex whenever patient try to mix micturate there is dilatation of the reflex uh, dilatation of the inspector and the urine passes and simultaneously there is increase intravesical pressure this increase intravesical patient due to the congenital anomaly of the ureterovesical wall there that lead to the back flow of the urine into the ureter and this can go up to the kidneys and can lead to the infection from bladder to the kidneys and it is for a long standing duration can lead to the vesico ureter or reflux uropathy or chronic pyelonephritis due to reflux so what is the pathogenesis of the pyelonephritis okay so normal human bladder is sterile okay so there has to be a number of steps which might lead to the development of infection into the bladder and that can go ascend to the ureter and from ureter to the kidney so what happened over there one is that like normally you have some amount of coliform bacteria this coliform bacteria like e coli usually comes from the stool to the tip of urethra okay so from there it can colonize to the urethra can go to the bladder and can go to the ureter to the kidney or sometime we introduce bacteria physiologically in the female more common in the female because the female urethra is dilated and more short and more wider okay and there is a hormonal changes in the vagina usually the acidic vagina will prevent this infection but during the menstruation there is change of the ph and this coliform bacteria from the vagina can go into the urethra and ascends into the ureter and bladder and the second important cause is the trauma during sexual inter intercourse there is trauma to the urethra there is some trauma there is some breach of the epithelium and from there this bacteria can go into the urinary tracts okay upper urinary tract okay and as patient requires urethral catheterization and if you don't follow aseptic precaution or the catheterization for a longer period of time that will also lead to the spread of infection from one place to the from lower urinary tract to the upper urinary tract then if there is obstruction to the urinary flow whenever there is obstruction there is a stasis of the urine and this urine stasis is served as a very good culture media for the grow of the bacteria and then this vesico ureteral reflex okay it can be congenital or acquired and there is incompetence of the vesico ureteral wall and that will allow sorry for this infection uh, this spelling mistake it should be o allows bacteria to ascend the ureter into the pelvis okay and it affects a majority of the patient okay even 30% of the infant and the children when there is a urinary tract repeated in urinary tract infection and that will lead to the development of so that identification of this abnormality is very very important so that we can prevent chronic pyelonephritis and we can prevent 
patient undergoing to the dialysis and the renal transplantation. So what is the morphology of the chronic pyelonephritis? The hallmark of the chronic pyelonephritis are the coarse, discrete corticomedullary scars. Okay, there is a scarring. Because of the infection, there is fibrosis and this fibrosis will lead to development of the scars over the kidney. Okay, and there is also when you cut open the kidney, you see the dilated or blunted, deformed clysis and the flattening, flattening of the plapilla. You cannot make out the pelvic clysal junction. You cannot make out the minor or major calysis, you cannot make out the renal papilla, okay? That is lost. So this is what you see in the chronic pyelonephritis. Okay, so you have the coarse, discrete corticulomedullary scars and dilated, blunted papilla or deformed calysis, okay? Histologically, very, very important, you see the atrophy and dilated tubules and the thyroidization of the tubule. What do you mean by thyroidization of the tubule? There is accumulation of the specific proteinaceous material into the tubule. And when you see this tubule under the microscopy, this kidney looks like, like a thyroid, okay? You will see this in the case nine, the microscopy of the thyroid. You just look like the thyroid follicles filled with Colloid. So that's why you call this the thyroidization of the tubules. And this th thyroidization of the tubule is a very, very important histological feature to identify as a chronic pyelonephritis. You, feed, you will also see the chronic inflammatory cells, lymphocytes and plasma cells, and the fibrosis of the blood vessels. Okay. So this is all the mic more microscopic features of this. And the other the types, you have reflex nephropathy, where you see the scars mostly on the upper and lower pole because of the flow of the pressure of the urine. This backflow of the urine come to the pelysis and pelvic lysal system and that goes to the two poles first. Okay, so that's why you see the, this is pressure nephropathy or the reflux nephropathy scars at the poles. While in the chronic obstructive pyelonephritis, when there is a obstruction and pyelonephritis occurring in these cases, you see the diffusely symmetrical scarred kidney. So this is a schematic diagram for the pyelonephritis. What you see in the clinical symptoms, you have fever, pan, uh, flank pain or the pain in the loin, dysuria, polyuria, nocturia, Usually you see in the young women and the young women and the old men. Uh, in the urine examination, you will find pus cells in the urine and isothenuria. What is in the isothenuria? The fixed specific gravity of the urine because of the chronic renal failure. If you do the chronic uh, like your, your renal culture, you will find most common organism is the E. coli. And these E. coli, because of their flagella, they swam up from the bladder to the kidney. And the microscopy, you see the polys in the tubular humans. And if you have the old pyelonephritis, grossly you see the scarring and you see the fibrosis in the, um, in the interstitium, chronic inflammatory cells and thyroidization. Now we go to the obstructive uropathy, okay? Obstruction is important because whenever there is an obstruction, there is increased susceptibility to the, to the infection. There is also increased stone formation. And if suppose the obstruction is not relieved, it will lead to the pressure atrophy of the renal parenchyma. And that is known as the hydronephrosis or obstructive uropathy. This would have been explained to you in the practical as well, okay? An obstruction may occur at any level from the urethra to the renal pelvis, okay? And that can be caused either by the intrinsic lesion of the urinary system or the extrinsic lesion, which might lead to the obstruction, okay? What are the common causes? We have congenital anomalies, posterior urethral walls, urethral structures, urinary stones, benign prostatic hyperplasia, tumors of the prostate, bladder, tumor of the 
uh, outside the urinary system, like especially in the female, the tumor of the cervix and the uterus, inflammation of the prostate, urethra, urinary tract infection, pregnancy, and functional disorder, like affecting the micturation due to the neurological involvement of the spinal cord or diabetic nephropathy or in cases of the stroke. So this is a schematic diagram which might explain very well about the obstructive uropathy. Okay, so you can have obstruction in the pelvis in the form of the calculi, tumors, or urethropelvic stricture. You might have the intrinsic obstruction in the ureter due to stone, due to tumors, or the blood clot coming from the kidney or sometimes necrotic papilla or the tumor particles coming and getting obstructed. You know that where are the stricture or where is the ureter, ureter is constricted. So that places you will find the this intrinsic obstruction. Extrinsic obstruction can come from the pregnancy and enlarged uterus due to pregnancy or due to the tumors in the cervix and uterus can lead to the obstruction of the ureter due to the extrinsic obstruction or you have the retroperitoneal fibrosis because ureter passes through the retroperitoneal. If you have the fibrosis over there, that can also affect the ureter and can lead to obstruction of the urine flow. Then you have the psychoureteral reflex. You have the bladder stone, bladder tumor, functional abnormality of the bladder. You have the benign prostate hyperplasia, especially in the male, prostatitis and the prostate tumor. And you have like urethra, urethral abnormalities. So if you have abnormalities in this part, you have unilateral involvement of the kidney. If you have the abnormalities in the bladder and the urethra or the prostate, you get the bilateral involvement of the kidneys. So what is hydronephrosis or obstructive urine uropathy? Dilatation of the renal pelvis and glasses due to back pressure and it's, it's and it is associated with progressive atrophy of the renal parenchyma. So what is the pathophysiology over there? There is, due to obstruction, there is dilatation. So pelvis become more dilated. And you know the formation of urine is the continuous flow. So whenever there is obstruction, urine is continuously form, forming. So it will lead to the progressive dilatation of the first the pelvis, then the minor glasses, then the major glasses. And the time comes, the entire kidney is dilated like a sac or like a cyst. And what happened over there? There is a back pressure. These back pressure transmitted from the collecting ducts to the cortex and causing renal atrophy. At the time when the cortex and the majority of the medulla is involved, the renal function is completely lost and patient undergoes chronic renal failure. This will also lead to the decreased blood flow. Why? Because there is a dilatation. These dilatation will uh, like put pressure on the blood vessel and the blood vessel will produce little blood flow to the kidney parenchyma. So that will like pressure atrophy or the pressure ischemia and that will lead to the fun that will affect the tubular function so now your kidney is like functions of the kidney are getting affected and it is slowly goes into the failure because of the increased back pressure there is like inflammation and there is inflammatory cells, these inflammatory cells will produce cytokines and that will lead to the interstitial fibrosis. And there is also a chances of the increased predisposition of the infection and stone formation. So morphology, as you know, there is dilatation in the earlier stages, slowly dilatation, but that dilates and there is like complete dilatation of the pelvic glycel system. You can see the thin cortex and medulla at the periphery. There is chances of repeated inflammation and infection. You might see the like signs of inflammation like hemorrhage. Sometimes you might see the stone formation. And in the advanced cases, you will not identify that this is a kidney. You just find a dilated calicial system. In the microscopy, you might find some atrophied nephron, some atrophied glomeruli. Okay. So, 
what happened there may be unilateral complete or partial hydronephrosis it may remain silent for a long period of time because unaffected kidney will take over the functions but when unilateral will present with the sign and symptoms when there is infection there is pyelonephritis in the skin tree what are the sign and symptoms you have polyuria nocturia you might have secondary renal formation pain scarring and atrophy of the papilla can lead to the tubular interstitial nephritis and all the sign and symptoms of the lower urinary tract infection along with the sign and symptoms of the pyelonephritis fever and the blank pain or costovertebral or loin pain so now we go to the stone formation as you know there is a stasis of the urine due to obstruction and that lead to the stone formation that can known as the renal stones renal calculi or urolithiasis these are the terminologies used for the stone formation so that can happen at any level from urethra that can happen in the urethra that can happen in the bla bladder that can happen in to the kidneys okay it is affect more commonly men than the women and what are the types of stone you have the most common one are the formed by the calcium okay calcium stones this is formed by the calcium oxalate or calcium oxalate mixed with calcium phosphate then another type common type which is seen in the 15% of the type this is known as a triple stone or struvite stone it is formed by the magnesium ammonium phosphate okay and another name for the triple stone is the staghorn calculus staghorn because it take shape of the uh, in the renal papillae from the major calyxis to the minor calyxis it look like a horn of a gazelle male deer okay that's why it is called it the staghorn calculus another least common one is the uric acid and the very very least common is the cysteine there are four type calcium stone triple stone uric acid stone and the cysteine stone so calcium oxalate stone it is usually seen in 5% patient of the hypercalcemia and hypercalcemia about majority of the patient can be seen hypercalcemia without hypercalcemia and some patient can be seen idiopathic okay so why this stone is caused by several factor hyper absorption of the calcium from the intestine or there is due to the renal tubular impairment for the calcium reabsorption or sometime it is idiopathic fasting hypercalcemia with normal calcium metabolism okay so this is are the three causes for the calcium oxalate stones formation magnesium ammonium phosphate stone struvite stone or the staghorn stone it is usually form after infection and what common infection is the proteus very very important to know there is only one stone which is caused by the infection that is magnesium ammonium phosphate stone and what are the bacteria proteus and the staphylococci will lead to the and all the stone occurs in the acidic urine this is the only stone which occur in the alkaline urine and why because these proteas convert urea to the ammonia and makes urine alkaline over there okay and whenever the urine becomes alkaline this will lead to precipitation of the magnesium ammonium phosphate salt and this precipitation will form crystals and this crystal will lead to the large stone formation uric acid stone usually seen in the patient with the hyperuricemia okay such as the patient of the gout or some time patient which have tumors in which there is a rapid cell turnover such as in the leukemia okay sometime it is idiopathic where you cannot see any hyperuricemia or excretion of the uric acid all the stones of the kidney can be diagnosed with the radiological examination only the uric acid stone which is radiolucent it cannot be seen on the x ray and the least common is the cysteine stone so this is calcium oxalate stone which has have this can this crystals can be seen in the urine that can be smooth surface or sometime they can have the rough surfaces okay and in the microscopy you can might see the calcium oxalate deposition inside the tubules now we go to the struvite stone or the triple stone or the magnesium ammonium phosphate stone okay so what happen urea in the kidney this urea 
there is infection like urea splitting infection either by the protease or sometimes staphylococci okay this urea get converted to ammonia and this ammonia will make the urine alkaline whenever urine become alkaline there is precipitation of the magnesium and ammonium phosphate salts and that will lead to crystallization and staghorn formation and this will sometime may lead to the irritation of the uh, epithelium and the transmission transitional epithelium of the urinary tract can get converted to the squamous metaplastic epithelium and there is chances of the squamous cell carcinoma so this point you remember if you see the squamous cell carcinoma you might look for the steroid stone or you might look for the protease infection or you might see the question like this there is so and so so history will be there there is like and what type of the tumor can be seen in this setup so you must look for the squamous cell carcinoma so this is what we call it as a struoid or the stag horn this take the shape of the renal anatomy okay so this is the stag horn calculus uh clinical feature of the stones are small stones causes like uh, sometime they pass into the ureter uh, and they will produce the ureteric colic and this colic this pain is the categorized as the severe pain the patient will turn over the floor if he has the renal stone pain okay larger stone cannot enter the ureter they remain silent in the renal pelvis and sometimes they might have hematuria due to irritation but they are high chances of infection so they have manifestation of the pyelonephritis now we go to the another type of the interstitial uh, tubular interstitial dis disease this is known as the acute interstitial nephritis this is can be due to the analgesic can be due to the antibiotics especially methicillin and that will produce type 1 hypersensitivity reaction due to allergies to the drug sometime it might happen with the long term use of ansets and there is sometime a latent period followed by fever rash eosinophilia renal abnormalities there is hematuria proteinuria presence of the wbcs or leukocytes into the urine leukocyturia and what is the treatment for the acute interstitial nephritis withdrawal of the drug which causes this okay then we go to the another type of analgesic nephropathy when you take the analgesic excessive intake of the analgesic mixture usually take the combination of two drugs paracetamol plus uh, uh, ibuprofen or ibuprofen plus naproxen some combination of the different analgesic mixture there is papillary necrosis and chronic in tubular interstitial nephritis usually seen in the women why it is women because women try to take most of the time analgesic drugs and strong analgesia to alleviate their dysmenorrhea okay so they need to be very cautious about taking medicine not to take too much of the medicine because they might develop analgesic nephropathy and a very rare complication of the analgesic nephropathy is the transitional papillary carcinoma of the renal pelvis but this complication is rare but if sometime you might ask like so and so history what type of the tumor can be seen or can directly ask this type of the tumor can be seen which association with what kind of pathology analgesic nephropathy now vascular diseases of the kidney you have nephrosclerosis benign nephrosclerosis or benign arteriosclerosis it is seen with the benign hypertension okay a uh, person who is suffering from the benign hypertension for a long period of time they predict with this type of manifestation this is involved small arterioles and what you see over there high line arteriosclerosis okay so remember there is two type of two manifestation very very important benign hypertension grossly the kidney will be symmetrically atrophic they look like uh, like what you call the leather grain appearance or the like what you see the you get the rice in the keys the like brown color jute keys that is called as a leather grain appearance kidney look like that and the microscopically you see the high line arteriosclerosis so you have the leather grain appearance of the kidney 
or uh, small at a uh, symmetrically atrophic kidney on the gross and the microscopy you see the high line arteriosclerosis your option should be benign hypertension so benign hypertension produce these type of changes malignant hypertension also have affect the kidney and what do you call malignant hypertension when a patient have blood pressure more than 200 120 uh, millimeter of mercury for a long period of time okay so there is increased permeable this because this high blood pressure will lead to endothelial injuries and there is increased permeability of the small vessels to the fibrinogen and the plasma proteins okay these Fibrinogen and plasma protein will lead to the fibrinoid necrosis of the arterioles. Okay, so you have these fibrinoid necrosis, a very very characteristic feature of the malignant hypertension. Or you have another feature, you have this onion skin appearance, which is called it's a hyperplastic arteriosclerosis, hyperplastic arteriosclerosis, and the fibrinoid necrosis are the feature of malignant hypertension while highline arteriosclerosis this kind of picture in a patient of hypertension is a feature of benign nephrosclerosis or benign hypertension you have kidney malformation congenital abnormalities can have in the form of hypoplasia dysplasia and agenesis okay we have another two important kidney malformation in the form of polycystic kidney disease so these are the polycystic kidney disease can be in the form of autosomal or the autosomal recessive autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease adpk day or autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease okay it is more common affect one in 1000 people what is the mechanism over there affection of the pkd1 and 2 gene which is located on chromosome 16 pkd1 and pkd2 on the chromosome 4 and these encode for the protein which is polycystin 1 and polycystin 2 and this protein is primarily involved in the cilia of the tubular epithelium cell so whenever these get affected that will lead to the formation of the cyst in the kidney and this cyst will form uh, in the kidney entire kidney and the both the kidneys will be affected person will remain asymptomatic up to his 40 years of age after 40 years or gradually urinary function uh, start to de deteriorate and at the age of 50 and 60 incidentally patient will come with the chronic renal failure you do the ultrasound and you find bilateral multiple cyst an entire involvement of the entire renal parenchyma in both the kidneys okay in saudi arabia two to three percent of the end stage ren renal failure adults will have polycystic kidney disease and this time sometime patient might have cyst in the liver spleen pancreas and lungs in the descending order most commonly it will be seen in the liver then spleen then pancreas and the lungs Sometimes they are aneurysm in the circle of Willis, small aneurysm known as berry aneurysm. Rarely your patient might come with the subacronoid, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And you look for the patient, you evaluate the patient, you see the patient might have the polycystic kidney disease. Sometimes patient might have mitral wall prolapse. These are the extra renal involvement in the adult polycystic kidney disease. We have autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease these are the four form perinatal neonatal infantile and juvenile first two form do not survive either there is stillbirth or there is abortion okay but infantile and juvenile can survive up to the age of uh, like early adulthood and <clears throat> They may develop hepatic fibrosis, portal hypertension, and the splenomegaly along with the renal failure. And what is over here? Here, there is the gene mutation in the PKHD1 gene, which code for the fibrocystin protein. Okay, these fibrocystin protein lead to the cystic fibrosis and the fibrosis in the liver, and that will lead to the renal failure, uh, liver hepatic failure, renal failure, portal hypertension, and the splenomegaly. Okay. Tumors of the kidney, kidney tumors can be seen in the kidney, bladder, and ureter. When you have 
children most common tumor is the wilms tumor in the adults most common renal tumor is the clear cell carcinoma or clear cell renal carcinoma bladder in ureter most common tumor is transitional cell carcinoma now we come to the prostate we have the brown benign prostate hyperplasia another name is the nodular hyperplasia you will see in the elderly men approximately 20% at the 40 years of the age and it increase 70% to 90% by the age of 80 the zone affected most commonly is the transitional zone the patient have obstructive symptoms over here so patient will have fre frequency nocturia difficulty in starting and stopping the stream of the urine overflow dribbling dysuria and have increased risk of developing bacterial infection of the bladder and the kidney in many cases they might present the acute urinary retention okay and they might require emergency catheterization bph is generally not a pre malignant or pre cancerous condition so in the bph patient might you will not see the uh, it will not develop into the carcinoma pathogenesis is very simple over here there is hyperplasia of the prostatic stromal and epithelial cells that will result in the formation of the large fairly discrete nodules which compress the uh, narrow the urethral canal to cause partial or sometimes virtually complete obstruction of the urethra and what happen over there involvement of the androgen the main androgen in the prostate is the dihydrotestosterone okay this dihydrotestosterone is formed from the conversion of the testosterone in the prostate by the enzyme type 2 alpha 5 alpha reductase If you remember this enzyme is very important that's why we use finasteride because the finasteride inhibit this en enzyme and there is no conversion of the testosterone to dihydrotestosterone because dht is the important androgen which will lead to development of the prostatic hyperplasia and most this enzyme is entirely affect the stromal cells so principally the stromal cells are affected and these stromal cells will have this enzyme type 2 alpha reductase and sometime the basal cell also will have but the epithelial cell will affect secondarily okay as in this you see you have the testosterone directly affecting the epithelial cells and causing the proliferation of the epithelial cell while the majority 95% of the time this dht will affect both the stromal cell and the epithelial cells okay so as you know the most important androgen is dht the most important cell affected or is the stromal cell okay as we know that dihydrotestosterone and androgen are the pre primarily affecting hormones in the prostate but there is also a role of estrogen okay but it is slightly less than the endos androgens but estrogen can also get affected in the bph and they will also cause proliferation of both epithelial and the stromal cells so this is what you see the different size of the nodules microscopy you see all the hyperplasia in the stromal cell hyperplasia of the epithelial cells and sometime you might see the accumulation of the uh, benign accumulation in the lumen of the acini which is called as the corpora amylicia now we go to the prostatic adenoma carcinoma this is the most common form of cancer is in the men and second leading cause of cancer death after the lung tumor okay risk as we grow elder it is seen most commonly in the more more, more than 50 years of the age 20% in the 50s and 70% in the 17 and 80 years of the age more common in the black than the white than the asians very strong family history uh, like hormones dietary factor and the environmental influences play a very very important role in the development of the prostatic adenocarcinoma so there is role of androgen androgen again androgen plays very important role in the development of the bph as well as the carcinoma and this can be proved by the 
therapeutic effect of the castration okay you take out the testis in patient of the prostatic carcinoma or you might give them the anti androgen treatment and the tumor will go back to the normal size or tumor will regress okay so that's why androgen play a very important role and there is also a role of genetic important i will not discuss over here if you are interested you can read it over here and if you find difficulty you can ask me so carcinoma in the peripheral zone posterior location hyperplasia in the transitional zone medial location okay it can directly spread through the blood vessel or the lymphatic and produce a very very important type of secondaries in the bone which is known as the osteoblastic secondaries and these secondary usually seen in the hip bones and the vertebral columns okay grossly the tumor will be yellow in color very firm to stony hard when you see whenever you look for the rectal examination and if you find the stony irregular feeling have a suspicion of the carcinoma there is elevation of the serum prostatic specific antigen and you have the strong family history and the gleason system this is the very very unique grading system for the pro prognosis of the prostatic carcinoma and as you see the in the colorectal carcinoma also have the adenoma carcinoma sequence you might see a pre cancerous lesion in the prostatic carcinoma which is known as the prostatic intra epithelial neoplasia pin and this pin will go from the mild dysplasia to the severe dysplasia to the carcinoma in situ to the invasive carcinoma to the metastatic carcinoma a brief about the psa because the psa is a very a very specific marker for the prostate okay and it is normally secreted in the um, like uh, semen and you your value is less than 4 nanogram if you find is 4 to 10 it is gray zone you might see it's a high suspicion of malignancy and if the psa is more than 10 there is a strong indication for the malignancy okay this is usually for the follow up okay but sometime the prostatitis and the prostatic at benign prostatic hyperplasia also have a very high level of psa so this is about our lecture uh, resources or the chapter number 20 and 21 from the robins and cotron basic pathological disease 10th edition okay so do you have any difficulties thank you any questions to be asked if you find any difficulty please contact me don't feel any hesitation inshallah i will try to solve your doubts okay so with this and okay, sorry you. convenience you should have had this lecture lecture on the sunday but sunday i was i came back from the like uh, india a little bit late and i have my pbl session so i could not take it on time Uh, do you have any questions okay so i will leave and thank you for your kind listening